Well, good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this special edition of The Journey Home that we're taping in Ottawa, Ontario. And it's a pleasure being here. Uh, it's a wonderful place. It's a beautiful weather, uh, a bit of a surprise. It's a wonderful a surprise in the sense that here we are in, in, uh, in, in the uh, late fall and yet the weather has been uh, shirt sleeve out for a couple of days. So it's been a beautiful time together. Also a wonderful chance to get to know some of the Canadian Catholics and converts. And our interview for this evening is Dr. Tim Lau. Dr. Lau, welcome to The Journey Home. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much. Now, are you here, are, are you, you live here in Ottawa? I live in Ottawa, yeah. So you didn't have to travel very far for an interview today? About three minutes. Out of your busy schedule, now, as a doctor, it might be good to let the audience know right from the beginning, what kind of a doctor are you? I'm a psychiatrist. Okay. All right, so you're going to break free from your schedule today. What I do in the journey home is invite the guests to take a big step back and let us know where you came from in your spiritual life. So for me, um, well, even before we do that, I wanted to thank you for giving me this opportunity oh, sure. and, um, and also to thank you for your own conversion story because it was helpful for me on my journey. Um, you know, your... your Contribution to Surprise by Truth was, mm. was helpful for me when I was searching. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, for myself, um, my early life was, uh, you know, my background of my father, who was a scientist who used to work with high temperature plasma as a means potentially of manuf manufacturing microchips, mm -hmm. um, used to always um, try to explain things for us. And I would say from that, I learned an appreciation or gained an appreciation for reason. And uh, you know, I always tried to find um, the reason for things because he sort of helped me find the, the importance of it. Did he, was there any religion in your family growing up at all? No, actually, I, I had no, ex no real experience or exposure to religion aside from, uh, sometimes I would, when I would visit my cousins in Toronto, mm -hmm. Actually, I do have some vivid memories of going to Mass um, mm. when my cousins would go up uh, just during Christmas and Easter. And um, I remember seeing the piety of the people there. Um, but that was really my only experience of ever going to church when I was younger. Um, I always thought it was so busy during Christmas and Easter, I thought the churches were full. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I didn't realize it was a Christmas and Easter phenomenon. Often, uh, I know oh, now yeah, that we, sadly, yeah. sadly I... Uh, I know when we go to Mass now, I have to go a couple hours early, earlier if it's Christmas or Easter to make sure if you want to get a seat. So your, your early formation then, was there really was no God in the equation at all for your understanding of life and the world? No. I would say that um, because I tried to look for reasons for things, you know, when I studied uh, mythology and looked at religion, I came to think that religion was a way of trying to explain natural phenomenon. So if you look at Greek mythology, I, I thought, well, these guys are just like early scientists. They were trying to explain why things are the way they are with the limited knowledge that they had. Um, so, you know, I thought that religion was more a type of superstition and it didn't really provide uh, good explanations for things. A bit like Freud's explanation, which you would learn later in your studies? Or? Yeah, well, I think... Uh, Freud was an interesting character himself. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Not always all that scientific, but, uh, but interesting. But humanity looking for a father figure or something to, to give meaning to their lives. Uh, I think Freud was an interesting person because he, uh, I read a book by Paul Witts, actually I had dinner with him too, oh, yes, yes, and yes, yes. Uh, he wrote a book called Faith of the Fatherless. And in it he talks about how um, the most of the atheists in history actually had deficient father figures. Mm -hmm. And one of Freud's hypotheses was that the reason why people stopped, or the reason why people believe in God was because they were trying to overcome the overwhelming powers of nature, because they knew they were going to die. He called it a primary type of wish fulfillment. Mm -hmm. So to try and save you from this overwhelming reality that you're going to die. But Paul Witts turned, sort of looked at it again at, at uh, Freud's own history and found that um, he had a defective father figure. Mm. And Nietzsche and um, Voltaire, many of these other athe prominent atheists, they uh, didn't have fathers that were there. And in some ways you can see how 
your father who's supposed to take care of you, if uh, he failed you, uh, how you can see that God who also provides for you, you would have an image of some of against God because the person that was supposed to take care of you didn't. There was a, I didn't reflect yeah. on Freud until later on, but um, when I was younger, I was... Younger, I was at least seeing that these early theorists were really just the scientists of their day trying to explain yeah. phenomena. So I came to try and find the reasons for things, you know, as a result of my, my father. And, and, you know, I, was, I had a passion for science. And uh, I used to like Star Trek better than Star Wars. <laughs> more, more because there was less mystery and more science in Star Trek. You know, it, uh, there was less a sense of the sacred or good and evil, uh, as it were, in Star Wars. Um, yeah. Star Trek was more, you know, um, more scientific, I thought. I relate to that. I mean, it's funny because <laughs> yeah, I'm a big old original Star Trek fan, and uh, of course here we are with our iPhones, and it's just like, <laughs> in fact, my iPhone opens the way, uh, the, way the old thing did. That's right. So I think, like in the old Star Trek, even particularly the original series, it was more... Um, you know, humanity, Gene Roddenberry had a view of humanity that was different, uh, that sort of, he had this idea of a utopia, that after uh, you ha gained a certain amount of knowledge that things would be a lot, you know, a lot uh, better, that human nature wouldn't be as, as bad. And even the villains in Star Trek were, you know, I think culturally contextual, you know, the Klingons were, the Klingons were maybe bad because they were Klingons, right? <laughs> and not necessarily because they, you know, they were really bad. Whereas Star Wars, there was a clear evil and a clear good, right? So as you were looking, now you're talking about getting beyond childhood and getting into the sci-fi and, and stuff. So as a, as a teenager, you know, I, I, my, my heroes were, I guess I was a bit of a geek in that way, but my heroes were <laughs> Stephen Hawkins and Carl Sagan. Ah, uh, interesting. Who used to, really? Used to say that uh, the cosmos is all there ever was, all billions there ever will be. Billions and billions and yeah. billions, right? Yeah, that's his famous saying. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and I think, you know, science... But he always had that, that idea that there was other life out there, right? Yes. Which was just the extrapolation of the idea that this all happened by accident, and if it happened by accident here, it's got to have happened by accident yes, everywhere right. else. I mean, that would have been your assumptions then. Yeah, in some sense, I think the, he, he did describe a type of mystery with the magnitude of the universe and our insignificance because of our size relative to the rest of the universe. So I think he had an appreciation of those kinds of things that were naturally attractive. I mean, I do think that um, all people are attracted to a perfection of the true good and beautiful. And for him, the truth was this. And I think in some ways it sounds strange, but I think atheists also are searching for God because they're searching for the truth. If they are able to accept the truth without their own pride or will getting in the way, mm. In some ways, they're searching for God, even Which, though, because they, they would make not, it wouldn't make sense for them to believe in a God they didn't think was real or true. Right? So, Which would be a, a strong confirmation of our Catholic understanding of natural law and, and, and God planting a seed within us that, that like Augustine would say, we're, we're not happy until that yes. is fulfilled with God. It's just that the atheists are trying to fill it, but they... You know, they, they've, they've decided from the beginning it won't be filled with this. That's right. So it's got to be something else. I think the reason we have this hole in our heart is because we, there is something missing. And I think many people experience it too. Mm. And for me, faith was like letting something bigger than the universe into my heart. Mm. So, um, you know, I think there, the, uh, the question of that search is something we all have, and in many ways, many people are lost. Were you cognizant of the search when you were a teenager? I was aware there was something missing, you know, as a teenager, and then when I started my undergraduate, I, I had many things going for me that were great. I was popular, I had a car, I hmm. had, you know, lots, I had money and things that I, everything I really wanted, uh, but something was still missing. Hmm. So, um, Were you being told that science could eventually fill that? I mean, well, I mean, I remember the professors really sometimes boldly saying that they could explain all of life from physics and biology and chemistry. Yeah, I was always looking for that explanation for things. And in the biological sciences, I was looking for it too. Hmm. But, you know, in the end, in reflection, I realized I could never find it there. 
you know, the, um, that search for, the belief that there is a reason for everything is the basis for science. Mm. But there are many things that science can, uh, can never explain. You know, I, uh, in, in later on I looked at the, thing, the issue of free will when I was doing my graduate studies. Mm. Um, my thesis supervisor was a Catholic and uh, you know, I thought I could explain everything with science at the time or the things that we could explain. Uh, I thought it was pretty easy and straightforward but then he started challenging me about things like free will. And if you think about free will, you know, people don't realize that there is something very special about that. Hmm. The, the brain, which is made up of a bunch of neurons, which are a bunch of small cells, uh, connect with each other and these connections are called synapses. And they, these synapses don't make choices. You know, you're, you're, if you, as you break it down into smaller and smaller pieces, what you see is um, there is no freedom at the level of the pure biology. Mm. It can only happen uh, in one way. Neurons don't make choices. Synapses don't make choices. So when I realized the implications of it, it blew me away. I, I never thought about the, the implications of it. And it opened my mind to the idea of metaphysics. Physics is, you know, the understanding of, of the natural world or natural mechanisms, but metaphysics goes beyond. Hmm. So it attempts to explain things like why, and, and pretty much every philosopher for the last three, two or three millennia have looked at the idea of free will. I'm guessing that some in the audience have been people of faith all their life, that they really can't imagine that there are people out there that think that free will, or that the will can be described biologically. Yeah. The, but people, there are, right? Well, they distort their own experience. They say that you're not actually free, you just think you're free. And you're not, you know, the, um, that you're actually not really conscious. Consciousness also is a property, just like creativity. You know, if, if, there, if we're completely determined and we're not free, we don't actually create things in mm. that sense. It's all determined, right? It's all, there's no freedom. And rationality as well is an illusion. So, um, Boy, that, and that tucks into something which others of our audience may connect to because there are religions that, who have rejected the authority of the church but have, have kind of gone wild with their own imaginations and private interpretations that have taken what you've just said and ended up that reality isn't real, so you have Christian science. Or the hyper-Calvinist that says we really are not free in the will, we're depraved because of our sin. Mm -hmm. So trying to deal with this, and once you, once you throw aside the authority of the church, you have all these other opinions out there, even scientists outside the Catholic understanding, trying to describe what you're describing. From, from a, did you go through any of those other ideas in your journey? Well, for sure, I, I began questioning how we know anything. Hmm. You know, in terms of epistemology, how do we have a knowledge of anything? And John Paul II, talk, and as well as Ratzinger, uh, you know, right. Benedict talked about the dangers of empiricism. You know, we, there are things that um, you can know without um, just the sense experience or, you know, there. Hmm. There's a difference between uh, deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning, and abductive reasoning. So, you know, in the case of um, science, which is basically trying to look at something and from a specific set of observations reach a general conclusion, uh, compared to deductive reasoning, which is starting with premises and reaching a conclusion based on that. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the how do we know anything really is, mm -hmm. is a, a very good question because it comes back to what truth is. I mean, what is truth? Mm. You know, if you just based on, on your own experience of things, you might think the world is flat. You might actually think we're sitting still. We're actually going through space at thousands of miles per hour at this moment. Right. You might think that time is a constant. It's not. You know, there are many things that we think from our own experience that are absolutely true, but they're not. And Thomas Kuhn, in his, uh, his mm. uh, book on the scientific revolutions, you know, it should be a, a highlight to us that the things we think are correct may not be so. Mm. But we should have an appreciation for a truth that supersedes 
our, our, what we think is true. Yeah, his, his use of the idea of the paradigm shift is another way of saying conversion in a way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because our lives go through these paradigm shifts that all of a sudden we see things completely different than we did before. And even trying to go back to the way we used to see it, we see them so differently now that we can't imagine, why did I ever see it that way before? And that's why I wanted to make sure the audience understood that you were, for how many years then did you, did you go before God even entered the equation as a possibility? Well, I would say it started um, in my graduate studies. Okay. So in my undergrad, you know, I, uh, my, I had professors who were very much against organized religion. And I think I remember one biology professor, he made everyone write an essay on, on the theory of evolution, why it was true. And uh, I think he was just trying to weed out people who, who were nuts. <laughs> you know, I think he was trying to people who, who uh, shouldn't pass, you know. And um, I thought it was pretty funny in retrospect. But my appreciation for something deeper came after I met this Catholic fellow who had answers to questions I, mm. I had and actually had questions that I couldn't answer. Right? So things like free will. And the things that come from free will, like love, if you're not free, you actually don't love. Mm. And all of the important human things in life become illusions. Mm. And that's the, those are the two alternatives. And I think when you can appreciate what love is, you also can appreciate why, um, why, and sometimes we're not happy, or why so many people are unhappy and so many people are lost. Mm. Um, you know, for for this physics, for not, sorry, my professor in in my graduate studies, he uh, he um, really got me to think about many things. Philosophy was was one of them, and from philosophy too. Uh, he, this, you asked about God, and uh, how did I begin to see God? Well, I realized from him that my view of God was kind of merged into a type of pantheism, because I believe the universe to be this eternal, uh, self-creating, I even kind of believed in multiple universes because of Star Trek, you know, or <laughs> and um, so, you know, the, uh, I, I didn't, um, realized that I had given the general attributes of God to the universe, that it's eternal, that it is uh, infinite, that, uh, that you know, these are things that are actually properties that we attri attribute to God. And, um, you know, when he made me realize that, I, I started thinking and reading more about philosophy, and, I, and he encouraged me to look at St. Thomas's Five Ways. And, um, you know, I think if you think about it, if you realize that the universe was created, um, then the five ways really make a lot of sense. All of our evidence right now is, is that the universe was created about 13.7 billion years ago. Uh, that time itself had a beginning. You know, hmm. the, uh, the St. Thomas's five ways look mostly at causality or contingency. Can you summarize those for our audience? The five so basically ways? things, uh, the five ways are based on this premise that uh, effects have causes. Mm -hmm. And um, the first way is the unmoved mover. So, and the second is efficient causality or, or that things have a, a reason for being what they are. And in terms of a chain of causes, you can't have an infinite chain of causes because you would never reach it. Hmm. So, and then the third way is um, Contingency. It, it's basically the same thing. It's based on this idea that you um, you have to have an uncaused cause as a cause of everything. But we know that the universe had a cause, had a beginning. You know the Kalam argument, which is basically that the universe had a beginning, and all things that have a beginning have a cause, and that cause everyone understands to be God. So, I think that uh, from that I. I could see that it made sense that there that there was a God that was outside of the universe, and if God did create the universe um, from nothing, He would have to be infinitely powerful, because He made power. I mean, He made everything from nothing. It requires an infinite leap to go from that, mm -hmm. and it would have to be eternal because He made time as well, right? Because time. And it's funny because, you know, 20 centuries, well, actually, I guess it was 15 centuries after Augustine, you know, who, mm -hmm. who, who came up with this idea of God being outside of time or eternal. Our empirical sciences sort of support this idea that, that um, 
that, there, that the universe had a beginning and that time was not uh, an endless thing. So you're at least at a deist stage, right? Yes. And I think there have been many scientists that have ended up there because there's these unanswered questions. Uh, how do you answer the, the infinite idea that given enough time, anything can happen? Well, there hasn't been that much time. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the idea of a deist God, at least I can put him there on the shelf. So when I get any unanswerable questions, well, that's just this God. But that God doesn't necessarily have a real relationship to me. Well, when did that happen? At, well, I, could, <laughs> I took it a bit further even okay. because in terms of efficient causality, which is um, things have a reason for being what they are and an effect cannot be uh, smaller than, uh, an effect cannot be bigger than its cause. Hmm. So, you know, for myself, I, I could see that the universe itself was related. You know, in terms of relativity, grab space, time and energy are all connected. You know, you, as you go faster, you get heavier. Right. Distance shrinks. Um, That's what I always tell people when we have to get a big car in a small garage, just drive extra fast, right? <laughs> <laughs> but they are all related in, a, in, an, in ways a mathematical formula. And if you can see it this way, that there, the universe is in some ways um, understandable mm -hmm. in terms of very precise laws, it points to a mind that created these laws and a mind myself that can appreciate it, these laws that cause the universe and relate the whole universe, including time. You know, it points to um, uh, the mind of God, my mind that can appreciate this immaterial thing, which are these formulas that are, are outside of the universe themselves. Um, it points to something beyond the universe. So really, really what it does from your experience is it doesn't just end up with a God you can keep up on a shelf to answer the unanswerable questions, but little by little by little you end up with a God looking you straight in the face because you're realizing, I realize. And if I realize that had to come from somewhere and then there you're looking God face to face. That's right. Yeah, I, I realize my own mind and I could appreciate his mind in a sense, I mean in, in a limited, very limited way. So you're right, I think reason can bring you to a certain extent, right? And that's where it brought me at that point. Mm -hmm. I came to the point where it made sense that God was one, he was eternal, he was all powerful, um, but I didn't know him as a person. Mm -hmm. right? and did, was it this professor that took you that next step? Yeah, he did. And in some ways, he told me stories of things, and I didn't know where the stories came from. I later learned that they were parables of our Lord. So, <laughs> in a very human way, you know, I think he showed me himself uh, what it meant to live as a Christian and to um, to be like Christ. So, um, that was definitely a you know a step for me was to see this in this person where I previously thought. Christianity was for people who didn't know any better, people who were ignorant and superstitious. And finally I met this fellow who could, who actually had much better answers to everything that I, that I could ever have conceived. Who at the same time was a good scientist. Yeah, he was a good scientist. And um, you know, he, uh, he also introduced me to C.S. Lewis and uh, oh, you know, you Peter Kreeft and and, um, you know, if you look at the historical, you know, the trilemma from C.S. Lewis or the quintilemma from, from, uh, from Kreeft saying, you know, that Lord Liar, Lunatic, or, and then the extra two are uh, Mystic, Mystic Guru or Myth, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at those options, it's um, by the use of abductor reasoning, you can see that the thing that makes the most sense is that he was God. And for me, in many ways, you know, the best argument against Christianity is that the story is too good to be true. Was that what you were thinking at that time? Yeah, I thought it just didn't seem, I mean, how could this actually be? You know, and, uh, but the other alternatives didn't make sense either. So it seemed um, you know, something that I, I really could appreciate at a, the level of my intellect, but also at the level of my heart that God would love us so much that he would come to the earth and as a result of this hypostatic union connect himself to the world forever. And in a way, um, 
not just do that, but bring us into his family. You know, it's uh, it's kind of like Shakespeare. If he had a character in his book, he makes this character and then decides to marry this character and bring them home. It's uh, it's <laughs> quite a, an amazing thing, right? Now, were you going through this journey alone, or was your family connected, or friends connected, or? Well, my so this this uh, professor of mine was was uh, was instrumental. My I started dating um, my future wife Amy, okay. who who had stopped going to church. You know, she uh, was brought up in the Methodist tradition. Uh, she went to Bible uh, Bible studies and Bible camps, and uh, hmm. so. But when she went to university, just like many other people yeah. who go to university, they lo she lost her faith. Mm. Uh, she stopped going to church. And um, I think she became just as lost as I was. Mm. So there we both were lost. But I think um, by God's grace, you know, we, mm. we started thinking more about going back to church, right, as a, as a result. Mm. Um, and then something personal happened to me. You know, in my third year of, uh, of medical school, my mother became sick. She uh, developed a cancer that uh, involved her liver, and um, she was dying. She was septic. And um, she, you know, she, when she was in the hospital, some of the, my friends, uh, they were, uh, this professor, he uh, introduced me to uh, the local Catholic Physicians Guild, and. I started attending these meetings uh, where we met every month about medical ethics. Mm. And uh, some of my friends, they came and we were praying. And uh, they prayed for, through the intercession of a specific saint, uh, Saint Escriva. Mm. And, um, you know, she, she also had some healing oils from Jerusalem. My sister, who is Orthodox, uh, visited and mm. uh, so uh, prayed a blessing. And during the tridium, uh, during, it was Easter, she uh, was very sick, but on Easter Sunday, her, her, she came home. She was uh, really? dying. Oh. Uh, she had a BiPAP. Oh. So the BiPAP is uh, something they often use in ICU to make sure you can breathe. Sure. Um, but it is, she was very sick. And then miraculously, within a couple of days, um, her tumors disappeared, her obstruction went away, and she came home. And it was Easter Sunday that she came home. <laughs> So, you know, we felt the hand of God in our lives. Hmm. And I think once you do that, you, you can't help but be changed by it. Did you know enough in your theological training at all at this point to be able to put a name to what was happening or to understand it from grace perspective? Or? Well, I, I saw it was a gift from sure. God. And, uh, you know, I really made me start praying more and. And I think that's what happens when, you know, you suffer. Or mm -hmm. it may be more than just your own suffering. When someone you love suffers, it brings about your dependency on something bigger than yourself. You know, C.S. Lewis talks about how he, God whispers in our joys but shouts in our pain. And I think that's what happens when we go through these trials is it brings about this fact that we can't do it by ourselves. And, and we depend on something more than ourselves. All right, why don't we take a break there? Doctor, and we'll come back after the break and pick up on your journey, both you and your wife. What was your wife's name again? Amy. Amy, you and Amy at this point in your journey. So we'll be back this morning. Welcome back to The Journey Home, the special edition here in Ottawa, Ontario. Our guest is Dr. Tim Lau, and we've, we've, we've cut you right in the middle of your story. It's Easter, and your mother's come home. I still remember that dinner we had, you know, when she came home. And it was a joyous thing with her, my whole family. 
Um, you know, in many ways, my mother's illness brought us so much closer together. She, she remained well for a few weeks, um, and I think we all felt it was a miracle. And, uh, but sadly, her cancer returned, and um, she needed to be re-hospitalized. And um, that was really hard for me. You know, I think when you, when someone you love, you know, you feel like God has done something and, and given you this and then you, you get taken away, it was, it was hard for me. Mm. So um, I remember really searching a lot, you know, and, um, and, you know, it's hard to see at the time when you're going through something like that, um, why something like that would ever make sense. But, um, you know, I think now that time has passed, I really, I, um, I do feel there must be a reason, you know, and I've seen things that have happened as a result, you know, my, mm -hmm. my brother entered the church afterwards and, um, but it, you know, it was um, something that you could only appreciate after the moment. So her cancer returned and um, she was re-hospitalized and in the hospital, she um, she was baptized, Catholic. So she was on the journey to herself during right. this whole period. Huh. Yeah, she had met with some of my friends, a priest who, uh, who I knew, and some other priest. And you know, I think it was um, for her. She decided she wanted to become Catholic, hmm. and so she was uh, baptized and and was the first Catholic in our family. But. Um, but she, as she passed away, it was, again, like I was saying, very hard for us. Yeah, I'm wondering, I know you're a psychiatrist now, so I've almost wondered where your decision to become a psychiatrist was almost a bit of a re, of response to a lot of the stuff you're discovering at this point in your life. Because I'm wondering, from your other perspective, before you thought about putting God in the equation, how would you have responded to the cancer that attacked your mother? You wouldn't have been trying to put any meaning to it whatsoever. Yeah. It would just have been one of the things that happens in this universe. And when she's gone, she's gone. That's right. So I, I think that's one of the big challenges people have with not having a deeper answer to things, a deeper reason. You know, Hume's guillotine cuts both ways. You know, uh, you mm. can't derive an ought out of an is the way something is, you can't say it ought to be or ought not to be. Mm -hmm. So if it just is, it just is, right? right. But um, you know, I think if you are able to step back and say, well, maybe there is a reason that you just don't see. Science itself is based on the premise that there are reasons that you don't see, but there are reasons. Mm -hmm. That's one of the fundamental basis for science itself, is that there is an order and something is knowable and understandable. And, you know, um, John Paul II in his encyclical Faith and Reason said that um, faith and, and, si and sciences are in a way um, two wings of a bird whose purpose is the contemplation of truth. So as it goes up. So in many ways, faith also tries to, to reach for this truth, just like science does. It tries to ever, um, at least in its purest form, science is should be able to reject things that are, are not true and keep moving towards this objective truth. I'm wondering then, at this point in your life, with you, you've allowed God to come in as at least a part of the equation to understand that, but yet without a full understanding, was that a difficult time for you, not having the philosophical or the theological understanding to explain the meaning of suffering at that point? Well, the fact that she became Catholic, it was, you know, it was striking to me, you know, mm. and uh, I know she, she knew also I was interested in Christianity and Catholicism, so it, it heightened my own interest in it, you know, my own, uh, and, you know, the, the fact that I, she believed she was going to heaven, mm. or she, you know, she had confession and she had... Uh, the sacrament of the sick and many things, and uh, you know, it, it was something that um, you, know, you want to go to where your mother is, mm. right? So, you know, for me, it was it was a powerful thing to have had. If it had happened to me years before, before I had ever um, thought about some of these deeper things, I would have been devastated, more devastated. Did you see in her any joy in her suffering? 
I did. Yeah, we did. We many of the staff who saw us as a family were, you know, often crying because we were singing. They were singing hymns and things. Mm. You know, we were. Uh, it was a very touching thing and as she died. So, how about you and Amy then? After, after the passing of your mother, did, did that springboard you deeper into your faith? It did. You know, I we I started attending my wife's church. As I was saying, she grew up in the Methodist tradition. Mm -hmm. And um, so we started going to church on Sundays, and you know I, I really have an appreciation for uh, for Protestant fellowship and yeah. what it's like to be part of uh, of a congregation. You know, you mm -hmm. are. We used to meet on Wednesdays. We used to have what they call the Salt Group, a sharing and learning uh, group. Mm -hmm. And each week we shared our dreams and prayers and and our you know, our hopes, and um, we prayed together. In addition to reading scripture. And I thought that was an amazing thing, you know. And um, it was a time for sure of growth for me and for Amy. Um, and uh, you know, the the thing that I remember though is I started having difficulties with the way some of the people were interpreting things, and some of the things weren't literal, and <laughs> felt very uncomfortable because people it almost seemed like they had preconceived thing idea of things, and then they would use what they were reading to try and fit the rather than the other way around and. You know I, that started bothering me, and um, and so I was reading. You know, I think more and more, and uh, as I read uh, different authors, I remember as I was saying, I read Surprised by Truth. Uh, How'd that ever end up in your lap? <laughs> um, well, I I was shopping at a bookstore once, and it caught my eye. It said Surprised by Truth, and uh, Pat Madrid's book. Yeah, yeah. Pat yeah. Madrid's book, and uh, you know I remember reading it and. I read many other conversion stories, and they were very powerful for me. I, and I also, you know, I didn't take, I took it at face value, but I obviously wanted to look up some of the stuff myself. So I, mm -hmm. I began reading the, some of the church, the early church fathers. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, I realized that um, many of the heresies in the church are the result of incorrect interpretation of scripture as well. If you look at Arius and Athanasius, the classic Arian proof texts, there are several of them. I mean, he was using scripture too. So, using right. scripture incorrectly uh, is not new. And um, scriptures are for sure our treasure, but it's part of our tradition, right? The tradition of the Catholic Church. Yeah, the area should have been, uh, you know, the, the big red warning sign to the reformers that wanted to base their life in sola scriptura. I mean, there was sola scriptura, and what it can what can happen with it. Right. So you were starting to see that in your own journey. I was starting to see the logic of it, and I began to look at some of the doctrinal issues. You know, the, the views of salvation and, and uh, you know the necessity of works associated with faith. You know, those kinds of things were. I, I started having difficulties, particularly with how many different views there were, and everyone said they were right. So it was kind of a, a difficult uh, thing to try and reconcile. So, you know, I, I think the confusion that that uh, that existed, not just in our own congregation, but amongst many of the Protestants, I I felt uh, was uh, it's hard to reconcile with the the idea that that God is truth and that He loves us. And uh, mm -hmm. how is it that if the they can't be multiple truths, right? so there is only one truth. The the. The readings this morning for um, Mass on this particular day that we're doing our, 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 our conversation um, deal with the statement about the kingdom of God is, is among us. And uh, blessed John Henry Cardinal Newman, in preaching on that, he interprets that as the invisible kingdom that is here. You know, like the, all of a sudden the shepherd's on a hill and all of a sudden there's angels there. It's not that all of a sudden they just shot down from heaven. They were there. Mm -hmm. He just was able to, so the, the mysterious invisible kingdom. I mean, you had to be dealing with that part of reality as a scientist, as you're examining. It's one thing to believe in love and forgiveness and this, but now we're dealing with an invisible world and invisible sacraments, mm -hmm. the Eucharist. Was that also something you were dealing with at that time? Well, I, I do think that Protestants in general have an anti-physical bias, and you mentioned mm -hmm. sacraments, so it's kind of like a, I, I think the, in that church that we were going to, they didn't believe in, in, in baptism that did anything. It was just a symbolic thing, right? right? 
And when we were going to that church, I, uh, I remember talking to the pastor after a sermon. He was saying, do you, believe, do you accept that Jesus was your Savior in your heart? You know? And I said, yes, I do. It, you know, and, it, uh, and, and then he says, well, you're Christian. <laughs> I was like, wow, that was pretty <laughs> easy. <laughs> And, you know, I, um, I was a little bit worried, you know, maybe if I what if happens if I change my mind and, uh, you know, hmm. that... Uh, anyway, so I, um, I wasn't baptized because they, they didn't believe that it was ne absolutely necessary, right? And, um, right. and uh, we uh, were married in her church, in her church. Um, and uh, in many ways, we were happy with the fellowship. It was a wonderful thing sure. having friends. And I think we can learn a lot from our Protestant brothers and sisters, the value of fellowship and how, right. you know, after Mass, it's kind of sad to see everyone do the Judas shuffle and take off, you know, five <laughs> minutes just after communion. They're just like out the door. Yeah, It'd be nice if people spent some time afterwards and um, had fellowship. Right. Yeah. But... Um, you know, there was a few other things. You know, well, I was going to say one that reason it's often hard in the Catholic Church is often the the Catholic parish, the little Methodist church on the corner might have two hundred members, mm -hmm. but the Catholic parish might have two thousand families. Yeah, and so you don't know if the guy sitting next to you is a brand new visitor to the church or a person who's been in the church for fifty years because there's just so many folk that works against our ability for this intimacy, which you can have in a smaller group doesn't mean we shouldn't work for it. I mean, no. that's what you're saying, the beauty of that. That's true. So you two are members of the church. Now, you're married in the church. We you're members married. of the Methodist Church, yeah. and uh, you've accepted Christ as your Savior. I mean, yes. you're, you're, you're with it in terms of that theology and that yeah. union, but still not the supernatural side of the sacramental aspect of the faith. That's right. We, um, so I was attending these ethics group meetings, you know, with these uh, Catholics, and... Uh, were you already a doctor then at this I, point? I was a medical student. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. No, I had I had uh, just graduated. Okay. Yeah. After we were married, it was in my f after my fourth year of medical school. All right. And um, you know, she we we were attending these groups, and I was becoming more and more impressed with the coherence of the Catholic vision of of the of the human person mm -hmm. and uh, of you know his destiny and of uh, of really a, a an appreciation of the historical evidence for the Catholic Church and um, and so I had this big interest but my wife didn't you know she didn't have this big interest and <laughs> and I think it created quite a bit of tension between us mm -hmm. because she um, she obviously loved her church and mm -hmm. and, uh, and um, so I think she um, it was hard for her when I was my library kept growing of these books <laughs> I was reading a lot of different books and and I think she was troubled a bit. That she was staying away from that library. Uh, yeah, she was hoping that, I think, as I read more, I would come to appreciate the Protestant side of things or, the, or that view. Mm -hmm. And um, the more I studied, the less I was content, you know. And uh, I remember one of the, the moderator of the United Church in, from 1997 to 2000, he, he's the head of the United Church at that time, said that he didn't believe Jesus was God and didn't believe that... Uh, that the resurrection is a fact and uh, was agnostic about an afterlife, you know. So and he's the head of the United Church at the time here in Canada. So I think it, it sort of highlighted how theology from the from the that Protestant the view of not connecting itself to tradition, uh, how problematic it is. Hmm. So I felt there was a real need to to uh, look at you know the. Not just the scripture as, you know, and, and just reading it at, and having your own idea of what it means, but also giving weight to our Christian brothers and sisters who have died. You know, mm -hmm. Chesterton talks about the democracy of the dead. Right. You know, it's mm -hmm. giving all, it's not just uh, us who happen to be walking around that uh, mm -hmm. are correct. We're, we're giving some precedence to, to what everyone else has believed before us. So, um, so Amy became pregnant with our first child shortly after we were married. And then after she was born, um, we were discussing baptism, or we were thinking about baptism. Or more precisely, I was thinking about baptism. And because she'd been baptized, probably. As an adult. As an adult, but you hadn't been baptized yet. No, no. Yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, 
you know, she, uh, one of the, my, our priest friends had asked, well, when are you baptizing your baby? <laughs> and we're like, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I began to search more into the history of infant baptism. And I became convinced that uh, it was, there's biblical support for it. And, you know, I think uh, obviously you have to put it into the right context of, uh, of the incarnation and the time and right. how there were adult believers and he was ministering to adult believers, right? Mm -hmm. So they weren't, uh, the, um, and they baptized whole households. But, you know, the, the early church fathers from Origen, Gregory of Nazianzus, uh, one of the Cappadocians and, you know, um, Irenaeus, and many of these church fathers all talked about or referred to baptizing infants. So it was not something that I think anyone invented later on. It was clearly something that was practiced by the ancient church. Yeah. So, and I was going to say there wasn't much believer's circumcision in the Old Testament. That's right. <laughs> it was an eight-day-old child. So by baptism being the, the, uh, the fulfillment of that covenant, it just makes all the sense in the world. For yeah. the Saint child. Cyprian at Carthage in the Council of Carthage 252 said that mm -hmm. precise thing. You, why would you wait past even eight days? And if it's to replace the new covenant, you know, you, it doesn't make sense to, uh, to wait. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing this as Amy? Uh, so, I was, <laughs> so I showed this to her and I showed her the evidence and the more I showed her, I think she became convinced at an intellectual level so we baptized Megan, who was our first child. Uh, so she was the first of our immediate family who became mm -hmm. Catholic. And then she, I think when she realized after the, the process in the baptism, she made a promise to try to instruct her in, in the faith. So she wanted to read herself more about the Catholic Church. Oh wait, so, your daughter was baptized in the Catholic faith? Yeah. But neither of you were Catholic? That's right. Oh, interesting, okay. So she was our first Catholic. <laughs> our youngest was the one that led us home, in a sense. So uh, she, um, so she was baptized, and so my wife started reading herself some of these books, and I think she started realizing that many of the verses she thought supported the way she she saw things was itself a bit biased. And I think one of the things that surprised her, the new, the new international version, it's, it's translation of Second Thelosians 15, which tr substituted traditions oh, for teachings. For teachings. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. She's like, well, maybe there is something that people are against tradition, you know? And um, Yeah, quickly to the audience, that particular verse, which Paul is saying, stand firm on the traditions, that in that translation, Protestant translation, right? Whenever the word tradition is to be a good thing, yeah. they insert the word teaching. Yeah. Otherwise, it's tradition. Purpose being they're trying to downplay the validity of tradition. That's right. Right. Okay. So I think when we looked at the, the she started looking at the biblical evidence for all of Catholicism. And it, I think she discovered how coherent and literal in many ways um, it was. So she started attending these doctrinal classes. I didn't actually know she was attending them. She was going to this, <laughs> at a university residence, a Catholic university residence. She was attending these courses, I didn't know. And, um, and then I think she started developing a love for this, for the, for this knowledge and the truth. Mm. And, um, and I think one day she also read one of my books on the shelf, it was Rome Sweet Home. Mm, by and the she, yes. Yeah, and she was reading Kimberly's story and uh, she was very touched. And she could identify in many ways with what uh, Kimberly was going through. Hmm. So um, she told me one day she wanted to become Catholic. It was a joyous thing, you know, for <laughs> me and my wife. We, um, At this point, were you very ready to make the same journey but keeping it more to yourself? Um, for a while, yeah. yeah, I had wanted to become Catholic, I think, before because it seemed to make so much more sense and uh, it seemed to me more to be like at, at home. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I also forgot to mention that my, we were exploring the Orthodox Church for a little mm -hmm. while because my wife was open to anything that wasn't Catholic. <laughs> and my Did sister, you say your sister? Had the it, sister yeah. was Orthodox. Yeah, okay. and, uh, you know, they certainly have a beautiful liturgy and, you know, they have a post valid orders, I think, and valid sacraments. Um, but they, um, they're kind of a, prim they have primitive in their theology. They're really the Church of the Seven Councils. Yeah. If you read Timothy Ware, now Bishop Callistos, mm -hmm. um, they, uh, 
they, they haven't really changed from after the Seventh Council, right? At least right. theologically, right. kind of stuck. And they're divided on nationalistic lines. And um, Yeah, the unity isn't there. The, the, this is, I'm wondering if you're, when you, when you look at your, your perspective, if you could maybe talk a little bit about how from your medical perspective, your scientific medical training ethics standpoint, you see the, the value for you as a Catholic versus you as a non-Catholic trying to understand those ethical decisions. Well, I would say that, uh, I mean, as a psychiatrist, you know, in fact, you asked me earlier why I became a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, part of it actually was because I thought I could help people more with a, a Christian viewpoint. Hmm. And, uh, you know, this idea of, of uh, more of a, uh, having suffering, having possibly a reason. Um, you know, I would say that uh, if you compare the Eastern West, some of the, a lot of the theology, if you look at it, uh, can be understood in terms of suffering and, it's, and our answer to it. Hmm. Um, but um, the Christian view is one in which uh, says that suffering is connected to love. And I think we, you know, whenever you, you, you do something to love someone else, often it hurts a bit. Mm -hmm. And it's proportional to degree, the degree to which you, uh, you suffer. At least in this world, you know, we are, uh, if you'd buy something nice for your wife, if it didn't hurt, didn't cost you anything, if like if you had tons of money, <laughs> it didn't cost you anything, there's not much love there. But if you spend the time to do something or, or if you bought something that cost a lot, that hurt, in some ways is proportional. So I, f I think that um, I am able now to, with this vision of suffering and is to help people see that there can be a reason for things. And when you find a reason, it makes it easier. You know, um, Viktor Frankl, who was a psychiatrist in Auschwitz, mm -hmm. uh, wrote a book, um, and he talks about, he likes to quote Nietzsche, who says that a why can bear any how. In other words, if you have a reason for doing something, it makes it easier. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that uh, from the point of view of a psychiatrist, if someone's struggling with something, if you have a reason to suffer, a reason to do something, it makes it a lot easier. From an ethical point of view as well, you know, I think one thing that I really appreciated in, before I became Catholic was the coherence and the vision of Catholic bioethics. You know, they, they really were, mm -hmm. were um, very reasoned, compassionate, and completely human, recognizing the human dignity of persons regardless of their capacities. It was something that I hadn't really appreciated before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking going from your scientific background without God at all in the equation to just a Christian background as you're training and then entering into this work. I mean, there you are with the Bible added in. Yes. But as you were saying, the opinions in, uh, amongst Christian doctors is the full range. Yes. Of what you're saying, how do you apply that into your practice? I mean, as a Catholic, as a Posted as a Protestant, yeah. and now as a Catholic, you have authority of the Church as well as all the, the voices from the past, as, as you quoted from Chesterton. Yeah, no, I, I think that um, the Catholic Church is coherent, and it is able to, I would say it's the one moral, authentic, and convincing moral voice in the world, the Catholic Church is. What other moral voice is there hmm. but the Church? And when people are referring to the Church as the Catholic Church, right? Um, and um, so there is something, you know, very special, obviously, in, in, in having that, um, that history and the tradition behind it. And, and you know, the Catholic Church really, um, it's a beautiful thing to be able to rely on, on um, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, mm. we, we don't have to invent everything ourselves. And for me, you know, with in terms of ethics, um, you know, the the Catholic view of things is is impressive. It's impressively, and impressive in the sense that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that we are attracted to truth, goodness, and beauty. Yeah. They are all connected. Yeah, contrary to what some scientists might think, that by you becoming Catholic, you put your you put your brain up on a shelf. In reality, it for you it would have made all the beauty, and meaning and order of science gain that very thing. Yeah, I think my, as a result of some of these, this journey for me, I realized that 
our knowledge of things is very limited if you think of it just in terms of science. Hmm. You know, Alvin Plantiga once said that it's very hard to convince uh, the, uh, a, a, a skeptic the existence of other minds. Hmm. You know, that if you were on a yeah. shelf, maybe you are a brain on a shelf. How do you convince someone that you're not? Hmm. You know, if you look at knowledge, how do we know anything? Hmm. It's, uh, I never thought of it before, <laughs> but it was a shocking thing to really look at uh, epistemology. You know, the, it's much easier in terms of empirical sciences to falsify something. Karl Popper right. showed this in Critical Rationalism. You can, it's much easier to falsify something than to prove something actually is true. So anyway, yeah. I, th I would C. say that Lewis scientists... Suess Lewis dealt with that in, the, in his Mere Christianity about proving or disproving the reality of God. Same thing. Yeah. Very simple. Well, Dr. Lau, thank you so much for uh, sharing with us on the journey home. Boy, I'd love to spend another hour talking about all the medical ethical issues, especially up here in Canada. Maybe we can do that another time because there's a big battle going on up here as, a, as well as in the States. But. For sure. I mean, the, we formed the, Catholic, the Canadian Federation of Catholic Physician Societies, and we, all the guilds in Canada are, have formed a, a group, and we are, you know, I think we're in the beginning, and we really want to, to, um, to right. try and promote the Catholic, the Catholic view of the human person, and, and uh, it's a beautiful thing. All right. Thank you, Dr. Well. Thank, thank you, you very much. And thank you for joining us on a special episode of The Journey Home. God bless. See you again next week. Mm -hmm.